Hey there, it's another edition of the Nuclear Pod Blast, the official podcast for Nuclear Blast Records. I am Drucifer, you can call me Andrew, your master of metal ceremonies. First Pod Blast episode of the new year, normally I would say Happy New Year or Happy 2020, but in our corner of the music world, it hasn't been a happy 2020 so far at all. Of course, first the passing of Rush mastermind Neil Peart was a blow felt across the entire musical world, and then Sean Reinhardt from Death and Cynic just a couple of weeks after that, and then, just days after that, Reed Mullins passing, Reed from a Corrosion of Conformity, of course. It's just very odd and detrimental to the rock and metal worlds what has happened in just the past few weeks uh, of this new year and new decade. And let's not forget about Ozzy Osbourne's uh, Parkinson's uh, diagnosis. So I guess all I can say is let's be happy that we made it to February and let's get on with this damn new year and this new decade, shall we? As always, check out NuclearBlastUSA.com for new releases, tour dates, pre-orders, specials from the shop, vinyl, bicycles, reading material, anything you need related to Nuclear Blast and heavy metal. This episode, our guests include Andreas Kisser from Sepultura, the new Quadra record coming out February 7th worldwide. Also, I had the pleasure of speaking to Anders from In Flames when the band were doing their recent headlining run here in North America. Now, the new In Flames record is not out on Nuclear Blast in the States, but they are signed to the label in Germany and overseas, so we still consider them a Nuclear Blast artist, and it was great to speak with Anders and catch up after, uh, haven't seen him for a few years, actually. And our first interview on this episode will be with Jameson Friesen, lead singer of Arrival of Autumn, who've been super busy since the release of their Harbringer record last spring. We'll get to all three of those interviews, a bunch of new nuclear blast cuts, and I uh, just got sent a couple of days ago a nice surprise, a new song from the upcoming Testament album that won't be out until April 3rd. Also, new stuff from Silosis, the live creator that's coming out soon, Fit for an Autopsy just dropped a new record, We've got something from the new Night Flight Orchestra as well. The new Suicide Silence album, Become the Hunter, drops on February 14th, and man, do these guys have a busy year planned in front of them. The intro track to the record, Meltdown, is online in video form, as well as this track, Love Me to Death. Brand new Suicide Silence, kicking off this edition of the Nuclear Pod Blast.
This is the Nuclear Pod Blast. Can't wait to see that entire DVD, London Apocalypticon, live at the Roundhouse from Creator. Comes out March 6th. That track was Satan is Real. Some great energy between band and audience. And uh, again, I can't wait to see the full Blu-ray. It's Drucifer with the first episode of the Nuclear Pod Blast for 2020. And we kicked things off with Love Me to Death. Brand new Suicide Silence from the Become the Hunter album. February 14th is when that drops worldwide. 
And some releases you may have missed in December and January. Uh, the new Avatarium record, their fourth release, The Fire I Long For. And that, of course, features founding member Leif Edling of Candlemass fame. Something you'll hear later in the episode, the brand new live Nightwish album, Decades, live from Buenos Aires. And for all you Nightwish fans out there, bassist Marco Hiatala's new solo album, Pyre of the Black Heart, was just released, and he also covers lead vocals on that as well. So be sure to check that out. Some label news for you. If you haven't heard, Carnifex guitarist Jordan Lockery announced earlier in January that he was leaving the band after eight years, three albums, and countless tours. It's an amicable split between he and the band, so no bad blood, and Neil Tymon of Devil Driver will fill in for him on the Meta X North American Tour, which runs the 13th of March through April 18th with Three Teeth, The Browning, and Scold, legendary Chicago murder metal kings Macabre, are now making their digital catalog available through Nuclear Blast Records. So for all you murder metal fans out there, go get it. There's a new video, actually, for the Ted Bundy song uh, from Macabre's 1993 album, Sinister Slaughter. It's online now, featuring Travis Ryan of Cattle Decapitation as Ted Bundy. Georgia's Iris have recently joined the Nuclear Blast roster and will release their debut full-length, Order of the Mind, on March 27th. A video for the song Burning Sage is online now. Also, while you're on the YouTube channel for Nuclear Blast, Check out the new My Dying Bride video, Your Broken Shore, which was filmed in Northern England from their brand new upcoming record. Also some tour dates, Cadaver coming back to North America uh, for the Dead Travel Fast new U.S. campaign, April 8th through the 19th. And kicking off in just a day or two, the Vader North American tour featuring Abysmal Dawn and Hideous Divinity starts in San Diego on February 4th and winds up in L.A. on the 28th of February. I'll look forward to seeing the tour at the Marquee Theater in Denver on the 23rd. And, of course, Abysmal Dawn featuring Charles from Nuclear Blast. Cheers, man. See you in Denver. So when I first heard the uh, recent record from Arrival of Autumn, Harbringer, last spring, I was immediately impressed with the band's professional delivery and production and their already mature songwriting skills for a still relatively young band. They supported Skin Lab across the states in late summer, as both bands are managed by my old friend Sean Glass. Cheers, brother. Although I thought they were a solid opening band then, it wasn't until seeing them in front of In Flames late last year in Denver where I really realized their live potential. On a bigger stage, in front of a more diverse audience, the Canadians won over the packed house, and people in the crowd were immediately buzzing about the band when their set was finished. I got a chance to catch up with lead vocalist Jameson Friesen outside the club before the set that night. Hey, it's Drucifer with the Nuclear Pod Blast. We're uh, getting cozy in the van here outside of the Gothic Theater, in Denver, Colorado, with Jameson from Arrival of Autumn. Uh, you guys just kicked off this uh, tour with In Flames and Red last night in Wichita, Kansas. So it's it's dumb of me to say how's the tour been going so far with one night under your belt. But God, how excited are you guys to be a part of this? It's fantastic so far, yeah, it's really exciting. The crew has been fantastic so far, you know, so it's great vibes all around. So far, so good. Nice, you guys just put your new record out, uh, Harbringer, on Nuclear Blast back in March. Uh, You've got a great team behind you with uh, my old friend Sean Glass, of course, as your manager, and Monty Connor from Nuclear Blast Entertainment in your corner. Uh, You guys are obviously working hard on the road as well, as I just saw you in Colorado Springs a couple of months ago with Skin Lab. Uh, supporting those guys. You just kicked off this big run. Needless to say, things are looking up uh, for the band overall. Yeah, definitely. We've been putting in a lot of time on the road uh, this year and just trying to get the album out there, and things are just going you know, better and better for us, so it's, it seems to be working. You come from a remote area in northern Canada, I, I even forget the name of the town, which seems to have given the band a hard work ethic and an immense drive to bring this uh, this music and your band to the next levels. Yeah, definitely. No matter no matter what, if we wanted to increase our fan base, we had to drive at least five hours to the nearest city with a with a metal scene. So we were always trying to get out, do like weekend warriors and longer tours, getting in touch with more promoters, and uh, really branded ourselves in the uh, in the Canadian scene. Where do you guys actually base yourself out of now? Grand Prairie, Alberta. It's a few hundred kilometers uh, kind of northwest of the capital of Alberta, which is Edmonton. Uh, That's where me and a couple of the other guys grew up, 
and uh, most of us have been there for at least a decade of our lives. We all met through music, and it uh, it worked out. Quite a diverse sound on the album, as well as the uh, the older stuff that I've listened to as well. Uh, what would you say are the band's biggest influences on the latest material that you put out? For me, it's always been early 2000s metalcore type music, and then Brendan especially likes a lot of 90s death metal, and even you know modern death metal bands like the Black Dahlia Murder definitely have influenced us over the past decade. That seems to kind of have been the two main influences, was the, the death metal and the metalcore, which kind of brought out a lot of ferocity on the album, a lot of fast-paced uh, songs, but then we also, you know, get melodic with the choruses on a few of them. Was it difficult to expand the band's presence uh, back when you were working independently and being from such a remote area, aside from having to drive five hours to, to uh, <laughs> play a show? Was it tough just getting your name out? Yeah, I mean, on top of being so remote, it's always hit or miss, you don't know how the show's gonna go, it's always an investment and a gamble every time you make a, a big move that uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and we've, we've had a few uh, successful moves. Looking forward to seeing you tonight. Good energy that you brought with the Skin Lab show just a couple months ago. Seems like you're just trying to cracking the American audience. How have they perceived you so far in the markets that you played? So far really good. Yeah, we've uh, definitely made a lot of fans and uh, some friends even. and. We feel really, uh, really welcomed here wherever we go. With uh, your plans through the end of the year, of course, taking you through Christmas, what about next year? What's on the horizon for the band? Well, we're definitely demoing material, always, and probably more touring, and we'll see uh, when we can you know, kind of schedule this next album in there. I think most of this material for the latest record was written at least a couple of years ago, correct? Yeah, for the most part. Some of the songs maybe even up to four years ago hmm. when they were first an idea, you know. So you've got to have new material in the works then? Yeah, definitely. We've, uh, we've got some guitar players who like to write riffs, so it's coming along really well. <laughs> Jameson, thanks for taking the time to speak to the Nuclear Pod Blast. Best of luck with Inflames and Red on this uh, North American tour. Can't wait to see the show tonight, what you guys bring uh, on a little bit bigger level this time around. Hell yeah, man. Thanks for having me, and uh, cool. thanks for coming out to the show again.
is the Nuclear Pod Blast. Get more info at nuclearblast.com.
That track is Calcified from the new Silosis album, Cycle of Suffering. Comes out just a couple days from now on February 7th. The band returns after a short hiatus. As Josh Sullivan comments, after three long years, Silosis are back. I want to thank all of our friends for their patience over these last few years. Cycle of Suffering is dedicated to them. And a big thanks to Jameson from Arrival of Autumn for speaking with me back in December when the band were in Denver uh, as part of the Inflames North American Tour. And again, that band is so impressive live. Uh, I saw them on a smaller scale last spring and then in front of Inflames on a bigger stage. And I think this band is ready to deliver uh, another record uh, that's going to actually break them further into the mainstream. So the new Sepultura record, Quadra, February 7th. Now, I've met Andreas Kisser once in my life. He and Igor Cavalera were hanging out at the Palace in Los Angeles in early 1999 at a Soulfly show, actually. The first Soulfly record was just released. Sepultura had already released against the first record with Derek Green. So I thought it was cool that they were at the show, and I did manage to say hello to both guys in the lobby later that night. Now, as an early Sepultura fan, I enjoyed the band's new direction for the first few albums with Derek. And, uh, you know, but after that, it just started, it started to get a little thin for me, I'll be honest. But with the departure of Igor, I thought the band started really focusing on different musical aspects uh, to where a different sort of complex energy was, was starting to rise to the surface. 2017's Machine Messiah was a bold album that proved difficult for the band to harness and record, but the addition of Eloy Casagrande on drums truly brought a new spark to the band. Quadra, for me, uh, is the most compelling and fulfilling Sepultura album in several years. It's no secret amongst fans that the album was approached and sort of written in four parts or movements, highlighting a different side and or era of the band over the last 35 years. Now, as you'll hear from Andreas, the number four not only has a great importance to the album and the band, but also to humankind and our history and our existence beyond. It was awesome to get full explanations about the background of the album and the recording. So after we play the first single, Isolation, I'll just let Andreas take over. Isolation from Sepultura on the Nuclear Pod Blast.
That's the opening track from the brand new Sepultura record, Quadra, and we have Andreas from Sepultura on the uh, on the phone with us. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to everybody at the Nuclear Pod Blast, and congratulations on a new record. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. It's a pleasure talking to you and you are your listeners. Well, the writing process for Quadra seems to have been a new approach for you and the band. Explain how you came up with the idea to write and separate the album essentially into four different parts, representing four different aspects of the band's persona. Yeah, it's more or less like that. I mean, I mean it came with um, uh, after looking for a new topic or a new direction, you know, to, to, to write. Um, I went to towards that direction, you know, numbers, uh, algorithms, you know, just, just something very, very much that we see every day, you know, our choices how we choose things on the internet and stuff, you know, all that stuff. And the number four, there's so many aspects of our culture that is divided by four, like the year, the seasons of the year. You know, we have the four horsemen, you know, the Bible and everything. And that was the starting point, you know, numbers, algorithms, and number four. And then I found this book, Quadrivium. Quadrivium talks about the four liberal arts, you know, the music, geometry, cosmology, and mathematics, you know? Yes. Yeah. And on Quadrivium, you have the the definitions of numbers and the definition of number four according to the quadrivium is is where things happen you know the, the the moment of manifestation that was the starting point you know and um and that's where we, the, the name quadra came you know number four the geometrical formats and stuff mm-hmm. and quadra it's uh it's uh, in portuguese it's the uh, sports court you know like a basketball court or a tennis court where you have a delimited area with a set of rules where the game takes place, you know, mm-hmm. and um, it's life itself, you know, I mean, our country, like United States or Brazil or, or whatever country, it's a quadrant where you have a set of rules of culture and religion and politics and, you know, why we see women in a different ways in different countries and different cultures and religion and stuff, you know. And in the end, quadrant brings the question, why do we believe in those concepts and those stereotypes and why do we trust our school? You know, why we trust the, the, the stuff that we learned, you know? Because we didn't experience ourselves, you know? Basically, I think the majority of concepts we have in our mind was, was implanted by school and movies and tradition and, and etc. you know? So, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, Quadra brings that, you know? I mean, uh, like this uh, uh, a self-question or inner question. You know, why do I believe in the stuff I believe? And 
and why uh, uh, people hate each other because of that, you know, because of concepts, you know, of religion, my religion is better than yours, my God is better than yours, or my country is better, whatever, you know, so he creates animosity, he creates this uh, idea right. of stereotypes, and he, he, that's where we learn how to hate, you know, and, and I think Quadra brings this aspect, you know, we should respect the differences and not attack them, you know, mm -hmm. because Sepultura had the privilege to travel for 35 years, we visited 80 plus countries in the world, you know, we music opened the doors in many different uh, countries, religion and politics, and we see in the, in the end we're all the same, but with just a different set of rules, you know. We all come from the same yeah. four elements of the universe as well, earth, water, air and fire. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah, because we're born and we, we don't know nothing, you know, we just uh, start learning and baptize and this is that, this is this and stuff, you know, it's very confusing actually. And then we start believing in that and we start, you know, defending ideas that we, you don't know where it came from, you know. Mm -hmm. So first aside, I mean, uh, divide the album in four, you know, like uh, in a vinyl uh, the format, you right? Know, like double a, vinyl, exactly. D, D, side A, more of the trash feeling, the old school, you know, element like big grenades or ice days, you know. And then side B, more of the groovier stuff with KZD and, and, and roots and, and against, you know, the, the percussion stuff and everything. And then side C, more, you know, like the instrumental stuff, which was very important for to do since day one, you know. Right, right. And, uh, and side D was more connected to the song Machine Messiah, you know, that kind of vibe of. Uh, the, the version we did from uh, Angel of Massive Attack as well, you know, more of a slower pace uh, song with a lot of melody and, and stuff, so... Let's get a little bit more specific on the songs themselves. In the first quarter of the record, the first three tracks, Isolation, uh, after a grand intro build-up, sets a pretty devastating pace uh, with some great start-stop thrash riffing and Derek's ferocious vocals. Uh, the solo part is also notably chaotic, uh, means to an end is a complex song as well, especially with Eloy's awesome drum patterns at the beginning. And last time is again more sheer brutality. Was the first quarter of the album any more satisfying or any different in the sense where the band was just absolutely able to aggressively let loose? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's the idea that we had behind, you know, really to to bring not only the you know, the stuff that we did during those days, like Schizophrenia, Beneath the Remains, you know, late 80s, early 90s type of vibe. Mm -hmm. Remember the bands that we were listening during those days, you know, like the hardcore stuff and the trash and all the, the German stuff, Destruction, you know, Creative, yeah, and all that yeah. stuff. I mean, that really influenced Sepultura so much, you know. Of course, Celtic Frost and Sacrifice, Violence, you know, all that uh, Bay Area trash scene that, you know, inspired oh, yeah. so many people and including ourselves of course you know so uh yeah that's the, the that was the idea really to to go uh, towards that feeling you know of course we didn't want to copy ourselves try to write another arise or another dead and burning sales that would be stupid you know and ev on every side you, you're gonna see it's like a you're gonna feel the difference you know that's uh of course it's all it's it, it is the same album you're gonna feel like you're going through a, a journey you know and uh and I believe when you finish the album, I think uh, you, you, you're going to have to start all over again because <laughs> yeah. there's so many stuff going on, you know, like throughout the whole things and really to understand what we're doing. It was like almost that we were doing like four EPs, you know, with that kind of a different approach of, of Sepultura's music, you know, mm -hmm. uh, through, throughout the years, you know, like 35 years and stuff, so many albums. and uh, and uh, But of course, we were thinking about in a globally, you know, uh, album atmosphere, but... Uh, it helps, you know, really to put the right riff or the right idea to a certain side of the album that wouldn't be, you know, too weird, you know. I like the approach of this. The second quarter of the album, as you mentioned, a little bit more of the groove-oriented stuff. Um, however, Ali isn't any less bludgeoning, you know, than the songs yeah. before it. It is It is a song that um, uh, I, I, I can compare a little uh, uh, structure-wise, you know, with Kairos, because... It, he has like three di different uh, vibes within the, the same song, you know. Sure, yeah. And, uh, and I and I and I think it, it represents a little bit of, of Muhammad Ali's story, you know, because he started as Cassius Clay, gold medals in the Olympics and stuff, and and then he came back to the states and changed his name, uh, changed religion, you know, said no, say no to Vietnam War. He was a you know boss, you know, very smart with argument, you know. Uh, I mean, Muhammad Ali is one of the 
main human beings in history. You know, yeah, because, absolutely. Uh, the guitar solo in the following song, Raging Void, is super interesting with the two solos harmonizing and split into left and right channels. Was that a detail that you came up with personally or perhaps uh, Yen's idea? No, I do that a lot. I mean, I, I like to do harmonize uh, solos like that, you know, especially in the studio, maybe with two guitars, sometimes with three guitars, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, on, on Machine Messiah, I have a lot of those. And in live, I'm, I'm using like a harmonized pedals you know to try to represent what i do in the studio but yeah i mean working with hands on, on the solos it's, it's so so great you know because he is also a guitar player he he's almost like a luthier you know very keen to details and stuff and he had also great instruments at his studio so a lot of pedals and so we tried a lot of stuff you know and of course i think that's the best part of the recording and i think he he thinks himself too <laughs> you know like the guitar parts and it's a lot of fun you, you spread all the pedals around and you know it's like a, an experimental uh, process you know which sure. is great
That's Raging Void from the new Sepultura record, Quadra, out February 7th, worldwide. We got Andreas on the line with us. Thanks again for uh, for taking the time. Your perception you. of the third quarter of Quadra is that it highlights the more experimental side of the band, uh, which makes yeah. sense as I find the acoustic intro and the layered guitar solo on Guardians of the Earth, Guardians of Earth, uh, adds a super ethereal feel to an otherwise dramatic and sort of stunning song structure. Uh, following that is the incredibly diligent instrumental, The Pentagram, again featuring many guitar layers and parts. Do you feel that your guitar playing on the new album reaches any new plateaus or explores any new territories for your career? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I think, my my intention, really, to explore uh, as much as I can. You know, I was... Um, you know, during days of, uh, especially Chaos AD and Roots, you know, I, I went away from all those arpeggios and solos and tradition stuff, you know, and I start working my, my leads more connected to the percussion wow. world, you know, more percussive leads with more dissonant sounds and stuff. Um, and, and doing so, I think I, I kind of created kind of a signature sound, you know, with that, uh, yes. you know, uh, propaganda and, and many other, like, uh, songs that I used the uh, the dissonant stuff that uh, I was purposely uh, trying to work more connected to the rhythm part instead of just scales and harmonies and all that stuff, you know. And, you know, starting with um, uh, the Mediator and especially on Machine Messiah, I really started to be the opposite, really trying to work more of my guitar and be more concerned about the leads. I really wanted to be more, to do the best that I could, you know, and... Um, and I start studying a little more uh, the guitar because I spend a lot of time with the acoustic guitar, you know, studying classical stuff, uh, which helps on the guitar for sure. But um, I, I picked it up the guitar a little more at home and really uh, practice a little more, playing like, you know, I like to play different styles of music. I like to play blues and other stuff in Brazil. I have so many different side projects and stuff, you know, that helps really to to get new ideas and new possibilities to, to play my guitar, you know. So... And on Quadra, I think um, I really, because of Machine Messiah was, was you know, a very difficult album to record and stuff because of that, you know, Eloy Casagrande came into the band and, and, and brought new possibilities for my guitar playing and, 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 and writing and everything, you know. And on Quadra, I think we are exploring even more, you know. That's why I think the, 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 the third quarter, you know, with the instrumental stuff, that's where it's the place really to, to show off, <laughs> let's say, you know. To try to yes. put uh, uh, all the, the the elements that we want to try, and um, I love, like I said, you know, the classical guitar. So I want to incorporate more of that sound, the sepultura sound, which I do since I joined the band in '87. Also in schizophrenia, I have the the song um, "The Abyss," you know, which is an acoustic piece, very much influenced by Randy Rhodes and Tony Iommi and all those great guys that really never forgot about the acoustic clean part in metal, you know, and Gary Holt as well, you know, no love, that type of stuff. Sure. Uh, the fourth side, of course, of Quadra. Now, the second to the last song, Agony of Defeat, uh, is definitely yeah. something different from the rest of the album. The melodic intro with clean vocals, the eerie vibe and orchestration paint a desolate picture at the start of the song, but throughout that six minutes, the song takes on a few different moods and changes before delivering uh, an abrupt but very satisfying ending. Explain how that song stands out for you as a writer. Uh, that's always uh, uh, it's one of the first that I start working for to the Quadra, you know, process, you know, mm -hmm. starting the first riffs and demos and stuff. And uh, I work a lot at home in my home studio, which is not actually a studio. It's just a, a room that I have there with my equipment and stuff that I... I stay by myself and just put ideas together mm -hmm. with the drum machine and everything. It, it was like that. I mean, it started with the, 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 the way you hear it, you know, it's like really with the simple notes and the guitar and then was building. And every time I had this geometric idea because the whole album was very much influenced by that, you know. Right. So the, all the stuff it repeats like in, 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 in fours, you know. And he, he, every time he comes a new element on it, you know, it's almost like a, a bolero from Ravel, you know, that you have new elements every time the song comes back, you know, like a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. And then when you and you feel the song is already there, you know, like uh, screaming on your ear and stuff. And uh, and then finally change for the chorus, you know, and uh, 
and also the, the instrumental part, the leads. It's one of the, the, the leads that I like the most on the album, you know, it's really, I don't know, it's really had that the, the kind of old, old heavy metal feeling, you know, type of vibe, like Randy Rhodes or Ozzy, Dio's type, type of, uh, at least in my perspective, you know, but uh, yeah. it, 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 it feels like old for us, not old in a sense that, you know, we worked at very much every detail from it, including when Jens came in, you know, with all the choirs and orchestration, the right stuff at the right uh, place and everything, and uh it was great that not only itself the song was like that, but the way we work the song uh, together was was kind of the same feeling, you know, like every element coming at the right place at the right time. Very cool. I mean, this this is the most incredible thing, you know, um, uh, and this I think is the, our biggest achievement. I think we are in our best momentum with the best label, with the best lineup, with the best, you know, following of fans all over the world and. I think uh, Quadra comes really to celebrate, you know, this great achievement that uh, Sepultura is still alive and well, you know. I agree. This this lineup is volatile, and this uh, the new album I think sets a sets a new pace for for the band. And I do like Definitely. I like the fact that it's um, it has ties to the previous album. But like, yeah. if you just look at the two different album covers, you've got two completely different things. So. It, yeah. there, there is separation there visually, I think, as well as musically. So congratulations on such a great record. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is the Nuclear Pod Blast. Get more info at nuclearblast.com. Man, we able to talk to Andreas from Sepultura. Uh, again, I met him briefly once previous, uh, but never got a chance to interview him. And he's very articulate, very well spoken about the details that go on with music and his guitar playing. Uh, he kind of took that and ran with it. I was glad to hear that. So, again, big thanks to him uh, for joining us here on the Pod Blast. February 7th is when Quadra comes out. Double vinyl, different colors as well as black vinyl, two CD release. And that uh, second track we played, actually, Raging Void, uh, my current favorite. Check out the pre-orders available over at NuclearBlastUSA.com. The new My Dying Bride record, The Ghost of Orion, comes out March 6th. It looks like you can get a double LP and T-shirt bundle at the Nuclear Blast web shop for $45.99. Not too bad. Sweden's Burning Witches also put out a new record, Dance with the Devil, on March 6th. Black, yellow, or red double vinyl available for that. And that just happens to be the same day that the Creator Live DVD Apocalypticon Live at the Roundhouse comes out as well. Yes, you heard me mention earlier that uh, I've got a new Testament track to play for you. Titans of Creation, the brand new record, scheduled for an April 3rd worldwide release. Juan Ortega once again recording with the band, and the legendary Andy Sneap producing and putting the final touches on there. Testament will team up with Exodus and Death Angel for the Bay Strikes Back 2020 tour, kicking off in Europe on February 6th in Copenhagen, Denmark, and will hit 25 cities before concluding on March 11th in Hanover, Germany. Please let the metal gods grace North America with this touring lineup. So without further ado, here's the brand new one from Testament. This is Night of the Witch. And you heard it first on the Nuclear Pod Blast.
This is the Nuclear Pod Blast. brand new track from New Jersey's Fit for an Autopsy called Shepherd from a new brutal record The Sea of Tragic Beasts came out a couple of weeks ago that album was produced engineered mixed and mastered by Putney at Graphic Nature Audio in New Jersey and the artwork supplied by Adam Burke again Sea of Tragic Beasts out now and before that yes you heard a brand new testament track Night of the Witch from the Titans of Creation album due out April 3rd on Nuclear Blast. Debut for the New Testament track right here on the Nuclear Pod Blast. Drucifer, your host of Metal Ceremonies. I don't take this lightly, folks. I appreciate you listening. So does Nuclear Blast. We all live for metal, right? Uh, And as I've mentioned before, I used to work for Nuclear Blast and Century Media doing promotions. And uh, back when the two labels first joined forces 
if you'll remember, in 2001, one of the bands that I was most excited to start working with was In Flames. Having been a big fan since the Jester Race, it was great to get to know the band as people uh, more while helping bring their music to wider audiences. I toured with the band on scattered dates of the Clayman and Reroute to Remain tours here in the U.S., as well as some of the band's OzFest main stage dates in 2005. Anders Frieden is someone I've always truly respected and have had great conversations with, uh, as well as plenty of beers over the years. The band has since exploded just all over the world in all territories, and one thing's for sure, they have definitely formed an unmistakable style and sound that literally hundreds of bands have borrowed from since. Although the band's latest record, I the Mask, wasn't released by Nuclear Blast in North America, they are signed to the label outside of this territory, so we still consider them a roster band. The most recent tour here in late 2019 with Arrival of Autumn and Red in support sold out in many of the cities it played in, and In Flames pulled off an impressive 22-song set list that went back to the mid-90s. So it was great catching up with Anders before the show. We talked about the addition of Chris Broderick on guitar. We get to hear a little bit more about his brewery. It's just awesome to still know that he's just having a ball. It's the Nuclear Pod Blast with Drucifer. We're here with Anders from In Flames. Just started your North American tour last night. How was Wichita, Kansas? <laughs> well, it was good. Uh, I haven't been in Wichita for either for a while or ever. I can't remember. <laughs> Maybe forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's been so many shows. You tend to sort of forget where you've been, and you walk into the club and be like, hmm, "Yeah, cool. I've been here." You know, uh, and <laughs> the that, smell maybe or something yeah. brings it back. In, we're in Denver tonight, though, and I've been there. Have been many, many times, and I have good good memories. What was your last uh, show with uh, when you were supporting Within Temptation? I don't think you you were a little under the weather, so. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, not even uh, drinking that night. No, no. Well, then, then you know I'm under the weather if I'm not drinking. Usually it happens once during a long tour. You get sick, and for me, being the vocalist, it's difficult. You know. Obviously. Well, speaking of the new material, In Flames continues to walk a uh, thin line between you know super heavy rhythms, always interesting guitar work, and of course your diverse uh, vocal delivery. Do you feel that the band is more? Uh, comfortable now writing new material preparing for a new record than say 10 or 15 years ago we always live in the moment I, I, I mean take 15 years back and I mean we didn't know what was gonna happen in the future but obviously we feel like we are better songwriters or musicians whatever but that's yeah, that's our you know craftsmanship you know like we know that part and but then it's a matter of taste for for the audience if whether you're like old or new or everything but I, I know how to behave in a studio I know how to get certain parts done you know I know how to get there and and sure I, I mean I mean you should be a better how do you say a worker after doing this for 20 plus years you know? yeah so yeah I, I mean, I, I love being in a studio, I love creating songs and coming from nothing to something that you feel super happy about, you know? Well, the last time I interviewed you, I think it was around the Sounds album, uh, when that came out, and something I always remembered from that interview was at the time you said that your greatest accomplishment with the band was actually having a sound, forming a sound, whether it's melodic or brutal, it's in flames, you know it's in flames. Again, we're just who we are and doing what we feel like you know with we don't tend to listen to any outside pressure either from fans or label you know it's mm -hmm. we write what we want to write and however it's perceived then then that's it you know i mean we always you're always proud of what you you create and what you when you release it if you're not proud and if you're not happy then why why releasing it at all you know um i i, I don't get when bands said yeah well this this new album is you know, it's not as good as the previous one. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> it should always be, you know, like your best work. At that you, time. At exactly. that time for for you. And then obviously, um, again, fans have their favorites and so on. But it's very true what I answered, though. I mean, coming from a small town in, in Sweden and being recognized all over the world where people could say, okay, I hear that's in flames. That's, uh, that's probably, yeah, that's the greatest achievement, you know. And I'm very, very proud of what we've done. and that we're still here and still have a good time, you know, like, like, fuck, I love going on stage, I love seeing our fans out there, and I love creating the music, so whenever, I will keep on going until that feeling disappears. 
it doesn't seem like you guys have really. I mean, some of your some of your albums, you've you've definitely ventured off into some some uh, some farther territory, but you still keep that rooted sound. I, I think. I mean, we can't escape from who we are, you know. And uh, I think a lot of different like how the albums are are. are perceived from a fan's perspective there's also a lot of when it comes to the production how it, how it actually sounds if you take some of the earlier riffs and put that in the latest album it would easily blend in and the other way around you know um, and I still love the, that type of metal where we're coming from but as an artist I just want to create something new something different uh, without sort of losing the the heart and the soul of In Flames Mm -hmm. uh, then that could be debatable, I guess, you know, but it, it is, for me at least, it's just, it has to stay true to who I am and what I, you know, how I, I want, where I want In Flames to be. When you, what you can see now, I mean, on this tour we go all the way back to, to Luna Strain up until to today and, wow. and it's, it's just like, you know, I'm f feeling fucking awesome when we play those songs and I, I love it and I think it go, goes really well together with them. As I said, as I said many times with with the, the new stuff. Well, one question about beer, um, Frequency Beer Works. You're a part owner, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I did a little uh, looking around on the I website. I am actually a founder as well because we've, we've uh, I started that uh, seven or eight years ago. Go to different brewers to to do my own beer with them. You know, creating collaborate. Yeah. yeah, having a recipe. What do you call you call them? Uh, um, uh, ghost brewer or whatever like yeah, so yeah. so but now since three years back I've had my my own place you know. I, I looked around on the website a little bit I noticed uh, I forget the name of it but it was a Stockholm style IPA yeah so for us uh, North Americans yeah. who uh, who know West Coast and East Coast yeah. IPAs so uh, differentiate the the Stockholm style no it's pretty simple because I mean it, it, the inspiration I would say from is uh, like a New England IPA type, you know, but we are not situated in New England as far as I know so and nobody claimed the Stockholm IPA title so we're like fuck it let's do it, you know, uh, we use in that one though we use two American hops and two uh, hops from New Zealand so you listed the hops on the uh, they're listed on the website I saw, yeah, so yeah I recognize them yeah. yeah yeah so it's New Zealand hops and American hops Gotcha. Well, your current live lineup is super tight and impressive, as evident uh, back in the spring. Uh, describe what having our old friend Chris Broderick in the band, what that does for your live performances. I mean, Chris is, uh, is a great guy and came in and helped us in a, in a difficult situation. Uh, we, we were put in a difficult situation and he's awesome, you know. He's uh, super skilled and uh, I think we sound better than ever on stage, you know, like super tight with Chris, with the other guys and, and our old dudes that have been in the band for a while, um, but it's it's easy, you know. Yeah, you've toured with him over the years. Yeah, I mean, band, we, so. we met when he was in Jack Panzer, yeah. like 19, 18 years ago. Was that, uh, so, Ice Earth Tour, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good memories and a lot of no memories, I presume. <laughs> I, I tried to kill him over yeah, the years, yeah. but it's tough. It's yeah, tough. Yeah, yeah. You played your first show in the States just over 20 years ago, I remember, with the Milwaukee Metal Fest, uh, and then the dates that you did surrounding the Colony release, I uh -huh. think with Moonspell. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Those dates true. back then. Yes. And then in uh, 2000, the uh, Nightmare Across uh, Nightmare Before Christmas tour after Clayman came out with Nevermore and Shadows Fall. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I was on 11 or 12 of those shows. Yeah. So uh, it took a long time for the band to develop uh, the diverse and truly dedicated fan base that you have on this side of the Atlantic. So what sets the crowds apart over here than maybe again your other rabid fan bases in the rest of the world? Oh, difficult, difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, it seemed. I mean. For pre and internet and or in the early days, it was more easy to to see the differences, you know. Now everybody's watching YouTube's or watching whatever streaming or whatever, and everybody knows how to move, how to behave, how to do the same type of chanting, how to do so. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, I mean, here we, I mean, we have dedicated fans all over, and we never focused on one territory. We've right. always been like, oh, let, now let's do, uh, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, all over. Northern Europe, we do Asia, Australia, over here, so in North America, South America, and it's 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 been a never-ending crisscross across the globe. Um, and I, I'm I'm super. I mean, the reason we can do what we do is because of the fans, you know. And 
otherwise I would be home in a cellar creating these songs and I don't know if I honestly would have lasted la that long you know their fans help you pull that energy out you know um, having this is it's the best job anyone can ask for you know it's amazing great look forward to seeing this headlining set list with a lot of older material mixed with the new stuff so best of luck on this u.s run and the rest of the campaign for the tour and then you welcome Matt. Much appreciate thank you it. If you're into heavy metal literature, then you certainly know Martin Popoff's name. He released the book The Top 500 Heavy Metal Songs of All Time in 2003. However, he began soliciting top 20 lists from artists, managers, 
as well as label reps for a few years previous to that, and I was able to contribute my list of top 20 heavy metal songs of all time to the research of that book. Well, Food for the Gods, from the Horacle record from In Flames, was on my list of top 20 heavy metal songs of all time at that time. So it was part of the list that I sent in to Martin for the research, quote-unquote, for that book. And a huge thanks to Anders uh, for taking the time in Denver just a couple of months ago to sit down with me on the tour bus before the show and, you know, just catch up again. That's about going to do it for this episode of the Nuclear Pod Blast. And as always, a big thanks to the North American office for letting me put these Pod Blast episodes together for you. You'll hear something from the new Decades Live in Buenos Aires album from Nightwish here in a few minutes. But before that, Sweden's Night Flight Orchestra featuring Soilworks Bjorn Strid and David Anderson, as well as traveling bass aficionado Charlie D'Angelo, are back with another full assault on your senses. Aromantic expands on the band's already established good time sound and is poised to take you on another nostalgic ride. Out worldwide on February 29th, here's the first single and video for Divinals from Night Flight Orchestra. This is Drucifer saying thanks for listening to the Nuclear Pod Blast. And thanks for being so damned metal.
¡Muchas gracias! This is the Nuclear Pod Blast. Get more info at nuclearblast.com.